Well, here we are again, episode two, Raw Otters Podcast. I appreciate you listening. Appreciate you coming back or coming by for the first time, whatever. If you're listening to this 10 years down the road, what's going on? What's different? We are uh, currently in a time of the coronavirus, COVID-19. And uh, so I obviously put this podcast together to just get journalists who are sitting at home, automotive journalists sitting at home doing nothing to uh, talk, be able to have a voice, be able to have uh, the ability to talk to someone else outside of their pets or their significant other or their children who have stopped listening. And yeah, this is this is also me being able to talk to people or listen to people that I really like and personally and that I've always enjoyed the company of. I hope you enjoyed the first episode. If you have not listened to that, listen to Alana Shear. It's a great episode. Now for the second podcast, I decided to have someone on that I like again, which you'll just, you'll notice that every single podcast is somebody that I like, somebody that I respect and appreciate. And this time it's Kristen Shaw. Now Kristen is a journalist out of Austin, Texas. She's also a freelance writer specializing in automotive, aviation, and technology. She has a YouTube channel as well as a website called Drive Mode Show. So drivemodeshow.com and Drive Mode Show on uh, YouTube. And uh, she has great opinions, great reviews. And she also is, a, is on the staff at the Airport Improvement Magazine and is currently the president of the Texas Auto Writers Association, which is a pretty big deal, really is. So Chris and I talk a little bit about it, but the first time we actually met was at the 2020 Toyota Corolla launch in Savannah, Georgia. We were both taken down there in, uh, what, January, February of 2019. So a year ago this time, uh, we actually first met and hung out. Um, she was great, enjoyed my time with her, and we've become friendly on Facebook and Instagram and, you know, all that good stuff on social media. We, you know, follow each other and chat and, you know, whatever. All that good stuff. But Kristen is somebody that I, I really like. I think she has a she has a good voice in the industry. But but more so, the first two podcasts, I'm extremely proud of the fact that I've had two women that I think have different styles of writing, different styles of, of voices for how they see the industry and how they review cars. And each one is great. Each one's unique. And we need both of them. You know, Kristen loves 50s cars, um, and she reviews new cars. But she also likes a lot of the modern technology, whereas Ilana Shear from the first podcast drives nothing but, or owns nothing but old classic 60s and 70s cars, reviews new cars, and hates most of the technology, unless it's Apple CarPlay. <laughs> but each, each individual personality is great. And it's important. It's important that we showcase the the different sides of the industry and also the differing opinions and that both can be right and that both are going to have their own following. And so that's why I'm really proud that that we have, you know, or I've had Kristen on as well as Alana on. And, you know, it's it's also great for me as a as a guy in the industry and someone who is very much so um, supportive of women in any industry doing anything that they want and rising to whatever heights they want to rise to, not whatever heights I want them to rise to. So that's why I think it's important to, you know, the first two podcasts are showcasing two women in the same industry who have just a little bit different opinions, but are both great and are both, you know, uh, people that you can respect and get behind. So it's, it's nice. And, and I think Kristen, the podcast is, is excellent. I, I can't wait for you to hear it in a little bit. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to, to everybody's opinions on it. And I just, I hope you enjoy the podcast as, as it's been done so far. Uh, this is only the second episode, so it can only be done two ways really. Um, but you're going to hear more personalities in the future podcasts. And I can't wait for that because it's going to be great. It's going to be great. And so without further ado, please welcome Kristen Shaw to the Raw Autos Podcast. How are you doing? How are you holding up with everything that's going on? Not bad. 
um, the other day I was worried that I was having some heart issues because I felt, you know, my, my chest felt tight and my left arm felt a little numb. And oh, no. so I thought, well, I'm just going to go to the, I'm going to go to urgent care. I'm going to call them and see what they think. And they said, yeah, come in. So I went in and got the EKG and I'm fine. It turns out I'm fine. It's just anxiety and stress. Mm. Yep. Um, but on a day to day basis, I don't feel too stressed, especially now that we just got out to San Angelo where my in-laws live and there's nobody within two football fields of this property. So it's, oh, that's fantastic. it's very relaxing. It's yeah. beautiful. That's amazing. I, um, God, I'm kind of jealous. Yeah. I'm in a neighborhood, but, uh, but yeah. also <laughs> I'm very glad that you are okay. I, uh, I had an anxiety attack a couple months ago and I'd never had one before. And so I thought the same thing. I was having, you know, you immediately you think you have a heart attack, you know, or you're having a heart attack. Um, luckily, I, I just kept thinking, you know, like, no, I don't think so. I don't think I am. And I actually called one of my doctors on the phone. I was talking to him on my cell phone. And uh, without him knowing that I thought I was having these feelings, I was just having a conversation with him to make sure that he, you know, on the other end, didn't, you know, think I was, you know, something was wrong, you know. And right. uh, so I was like, okay, because you start to get afraid that you're going to slur your words and stuff and that, you know, you're going to start <laughs> talking differently. So I was trying to talk to him normally and uh, just having a conversation. But then I texted my other doctor, my general doctor, and, and uh, I went in the following morning for an EKG and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, found out it was just, you know, stress related, just anxiety related, you know, your situation yeah. as well. But it, well, it really it does hurt. Change. It does. And it, and it, it does, seems like change causes stress and anxiety as well, even if you're not feeling particularly anxious or stressed mm -hmm. because it's something different. And in this case, everybody across the country is doing something completely different. Right. Exactly. We've all got a little something going on, you know, and and, and it's it's hard. I was talking to uh, Ilana Shear yesterday and we mm -hmm. were talking about how similar thing you know how everybody's holding up and how everybody's going through something different you know and and i've been talking to a lot of people recently family friends whatever you know whether it be via text or on the phone or whatever and it seems like now more than ever it's this is you know our generation understanding the things that you know our grandparents told us about with the great depression or world war 2 or you know stuff like that and I never thought I would see that kind of day in America where, you know, we're having to ration or we're having a, you know, a curfew or, you know, something so drastic, you know, um, now obviously right. we're not necessarily at war with foreign countries, luckily, um, in, you know, that are coming here to try and bomb us or anything or try and attack us. But, uh, um, but it's still, it's, it's a weird, scary situation. Uh, my wife works for the city. Yeah. And uh, they just had one of their city employees die of coronavirus. So, oh my gosh! Yeah. So you know, it it's weird how it starts to hit closer and closer to home. You know, and it's like, wow, this is you know, I I took it very seriously from day one because I I'm kind of like, wait, they're, we're being told we should stay in. Oh, this is fantastic, honey. We're staying in. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> if anybody calls, we can't do anything. You know, everybody thought I was a little crazy at first, especially with the fact that I was opening boxes and packages on my front porch and just leaving the boxes there and taking them out later and washing my hands and washing everything off. And everybody's like, okay, you're going a little crazy. Then all of a sudden, every other scientist and doctor was like, no, that's actually a smart thing you should do. And people were like, damn it, he was right. <laughs> so what I'm finding is that, well, two things. One, <clears throat> my extrovert friends like me are really going crazy like we really miss people i miss right. people i miss t hugging people and being with people and just talking to people face to face my introverted friends like my my sister and i were laughing about this because she's like stay home great doesn't really look any different than my life <laughs> right, did before exactly. you know so it's fine i also like seeing a lot of people that are coming together and coming up yeah. with positive ways to <clears throat> excuse me positive ways to change and to adapt. Yeah, right. I, um, I, I, a similar thing. Um, my parents used to live about 10 minutes away from me, uh, on a two acre plot of land and now they live about 40 minutes away. So it's a little tough for my mom and I, cause we're very close. We hang out a lot. Uh, I'm kind of a mama's boy. I'm also <laughs> very lucky that my mom and my wife are like the complete best of friends. You know, they absolutely adore one another. So it's, it's Aww. also very nice that it's, you know, that, it's great that there's that relationship with my wife and my mom, but it's also like I worry about my mom because my dad is like, 
you can't tell, nobody could tell me anything what to do. You know, he's like going out and doing everything. And my mom's like, I'm going to kill your father. (laughs) So, but my aunt and uncle live 12 doors up from me. So we see each other walking around the neighborhood, you know, and wave and everything, but they're in their sixties. So of course I stay away, you know, they're, you know, we stay farther away, but we wave, we chat from the driveway to the street sort of thing, you know? And, uh, but it's, it's also, you talk about that adapting and evolving and I feel like it, it is something that can, that can be very interesting because, I listen to Howard Stern pretty much every day, and I love the Stern Show. I love the people on the Stern Show. It's it's ridiculous. It's wild. It's funny to me. It's entertaining. And Howard had uh, he called this. He did three live shows this week. Uh, he called it from the bunker, and it was basically all of them on webcams talking with one another, and then they put it you know live on the radio so everybody could listen in and and you know enjoy the conversations. And um, Robin Quivers. And the wife of one of the one of the guys, Fred Norris, that works on the show, they were setting up a FaceTime cocktail party. So they were doing cocktail parties via FaceTime and Skype with everybody, with all the wives from the show. And I'm like, that's that's pretty brilliant. Like that's yeah, that's you know that it's may seem weird at, at other times, but now during this, you're like, oh no, that's actually that's that's very you know the it's nice that we as a society are starting to adapt to things like, Oh, I can't see you in person. Can't give you a hug, you know, but I can see you, you know, and we have the technology to be able to do that. You know, we have that infrastructure luckily um, to be able to handle that. And uh, so, yeah, but I think it's great that you guys got out of town because that's, and you guys are sitting on land that you don't have to worry about anything. And Oh my God. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, my husband's been fishing, in the mornings and then, you know, we're, we're tag teaming with our 10 year old because he's got homeschool now, right. which he absolutely loves. <laughs> he thinks it's fantastic. He's like, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday I made him take a piano lesson for the first time and he was oh, cool. so resistant. He's like, I don't want, why did you do that? Why did you sign me up for a piano? <laughs> so I signed him up for a zoom call with his music teacher from school. And she, I knew that she taught piano lessons mm-hmm. And so he did the piano lesson. He learned two little songs. And after they were done, he said, I love piano lessons. Can we do this every day? (laughs) That is fantastic. Yeah, I I played guitar throughout high school. So I actually went to, uh, I was very lucky. My high school had accredited, um, had uh, multiple credited uh, music classes. So we had guitar class. We had, you know, band or, you know, whatever you wanted to do. And, but I was, I actually went to college for music as well. And oh, I'd okay. wanted to play music for years, but my parents were like, eh, you'll never stick with it. And then, you know, the end of eighth grade, you know, coming at Christmas time, they got me a guitar and I was like, this is awesome. What do I do? You know, like I had no <laughs> idea. And luckily, you know, got, getting into high school and starting to perform and stuff. And I performed a lot in high school and then went to college for music. And it's, I, I implore parents all the time that, cause I always say art is, is, the greatest form of, of free speech and expression, you know, art Mm -hmm. being, whether it be drawing, painting, music, poetry, whatever your heart desires. I think it's just, it's, even if you don't do it as a career, it's nice to be able to just to walk away from things that bother you and go to something that doesn't, you know, that just, that changes the way you feel about everything going on, you know? Right. So I think it's, I think it's amazing that you, you did that for your son because it's a a very uh, remarkable thing. Um, I agree. I mean, art and we're also, you know, I'm also a writer. So I try to get him to write and I took piano lessons for 10 years and I did all that band stuff and played French horn and symphony and all that stuff. So I I do think it's important because you've got to exercise both sides of your brains and it comes in handy when you're coming into situations like this where you have to be creative and adaptive and not be stuck in a black and white world. Well, and also at his age at 10, that's, that's a, that's an age where life is starting to, you're starting to see where life gets tougher. You know, you're starting to actually be able to understand and and realize, you know, what the world is about, you know, and having something that he can get his thoughts or his anger or his, you know, happiness out on is remarkable. You know, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I remember when I was finally able to really, you know, string some chords together. And I started writing some music when I was about 14 or 15. And it was like, Oh man, this is, 
you know, I'm, I'm no Elton John, but this feels good. You know, <laughs> you just you get those emotions out, you know, yeah, but not everybody can be Elton John. <laughs> no, no. And sometimes not even Elton John can be Elton John. I mean, but it is great. I don't know if you've ever seen any videos of him actually sitting down at a piano. Um, he's been given sheet music before. I've watched videos of him do this and it's, it's, it's crazy. He gets, he'll get words. Somebody will just give him words to something. And he'll immediately just sit down and, you know, start, you know, fiddling on the keys and all of a sudden just come up with a chord structure and start singing it. And it's so it, cool. It's it's cool. It's amazing that I mean, I of course, you know, as a musician, I mean you understand this. You could pick up things and start playing around and noodling and stuff. But when you see Elton John do it, like when you see an Eric Clapton or when you see, you know, uh, a Billy Joel or somebody of that ilk do it, it's like, whoa. That's uh, because you're potentially seeing history in the making, you know, with a, with a song, you know, it's, it's it's quite beautiful and striking. But yeah, I agree. To uh, to kind of move this along, because you know this is a, a pseudo car podcast or going to be a car podcast, uh, pseudo. Um, <laughs> what do you think? You know, obviously with everything with the coronavirus, you know, we've talked about how you're holding up and you know, and potentially, uh, you know, adapting and evolving, uh, you know, our own lives. How do you think that's going to uh, treat the automotive industry? I think it depends on how they, hmm, how nimble they are, right? Right. So are they willing to look at things from a different angle? So for instance, I was talking to an automotive, um, an automotive auction company this morning, one of Mm -hmm. my clients, and they're saying, okay, you know, how do we educate the dealers on how to how to adapt like how how can they be ready post COVID-19 to get out there and and sell cars and what do they do in the meantime and that message is going to be different for different kinds of dealerships if it's a big conglomerate or a family group of dealerships they might approach it differently than a small independent and the small independents their challenge is you know they're saying I'm losing everything. This is my, this is my, not only my livelihood, but this is what I was going to pass down to my son or my grandson. Right. And they are just, they don't know how, you know, where to go from there. So it's just going to, there's so many factors. And I think that they have to figure out how to reach their customers in different ways. And I'm seeing that with, you know, Ford and GM Mm -hmm. and other companies as well, Nissan, they're stepping up to, figure out ways to help. And I think that's also really important. I think it is too. I mean, it's, you know, obviously we saw it in world war two, you know, where companies stepped up to the, to the plate. They had to, you know, for the better of of the country, for the better of the world. And uh, we're seeing that now with, with various companies, which I think is, it's amazing. It's very interesting to see how, I don't want to say how quickly, but how, or easily, because it's not quick or easy, but how, well they can adapt their facilities to start making something else producing something else you know right um because i i you know we see it as being quick because it's like whoa it happens within a month you know or a month and a half but that's you know that month or month and a half that they're doing that that they're laying out those plans is seems impossible in the beginning for them you know as they're doing as they're working with multiple companies to get this done and it's I think personally, so I used to sell cars. Um, I think I told you that when we, the first time Mm -hmm. we met and talked and I used to get made fun of all the time because I said within the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to be buying cars online and having them shipped to our house. (laughs) And they thought I was crazy. I mean, this was, this was back in 2007 when I was selling cars and I kept saying, we're going to be, you're basically going to have like a, you know, an Amazon type thing where you can order a car and have it delivered. Now we're seeing that a little bit with Carvana, you know, um, and companies like that, but I feel like it's, it's only going to evolve more and more from there, but going off of your, you know, how well the manufacturers can, can adapt and evolve to the new challenges. That's going to be a big question to whether all these car companies, all the American car companies are going to stop selling cars and they want to sell trucks, crossovers and SUVs that are made from similar components as their car brethren, but they want to make more money because they can, you know, they can turn a sedan into a crossover and charge you five, seven or 10 grand more. Right. And I think it's, I think 
it's going to be interesting to see how the luxury brands adapt versus yeah. the more um, mainstream manufacturers. So both Bentley, I did a Bentley configurator last night just mm-hmm. for fun. And you can customize it down to the, the last detail, you right. know, the kind of wheels you want, the kind of the stitching, um, high, the stitching, mm-hmm. yeah, the combination, the colors. It's really, really cool. And you can order And Genesis is doing the same thing mm-hmm. with the new GV80 that's coming out. You can Which I think is beautiful. Order its configuration. It's beautiful. And the same with the Aston Martin DBX. Mm-hmm. The configurator is incredible. There's so many options. And I think that people will like to do that. But if you were in a, in a bigger... Uh, I don't even know the words right now, but let's say you're um, Chevrolet and you're building lots of uh, lots of vehicles that have the same kind of features. Yeah, People Equinox. can still order that too, and that wouldn't be difficult, right. right? Right. But I think you know the the challenge is going to be for at least from my standpoint. I was also talking to this uh, to Madam Shear about this yesterday as well. Um, I think for me, there are two things that are going to happen. Number one, we're going to definitely see the used car market just skyrocket with cars. I mean, we're, we're going to see an overabundance of used cars, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're friends with Stephen Lang on Facebook. Um, on Twitter, I follow Okay, him. so, mm-hmm. you know, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, mm-hmm. you know, obviously here he is, somebody who is a, uh, you know, I don't want to say part-time journalist because, you know, but he's just kind of a freelancer who writes whenever he, he, you know, kind of feels like it. But as a, as a private dealer, you know, as, as somebody who owns a lot and he goes to auctions and, and sells all these cars, it's amazing what he's seeing. I mean, he, I don't know if you've seen any of the stuff he's been posting recently, but mm-hmm. yeah, rental car companies are selling cars with a thousand miles on them just to get them out of their inventory, which is, yeah, which is amazing. But I I was saying to my wife the other day that we're going to see, especially at least in my opinion, I think we're going to see classic car values. There are a lot of superficial values with classic and antique cars where they're not necessarily worth that price, but the, but the market has just deemed them valuable enough because people are, you know, there's so much hype around them. I feel like some of those cars are just going to fall. You know, they're going to really? drop. I, I, I do because I think it happened with when I was in high school in the early 2000s. It happened. It was a big thing. I don't know if you remember any of that stuff, but the classic car time frame, like Barrett Jackson and stuff like that in the early 2000s, when it when it came to Camaros and uh, uh, Challengers and Chargers and Mustangs, there were prices of cars that were through the roof. I mean, I mm-hmm. remember when I was in you know, getting out of high school, uh, you know, a 68 Z28 was astronomical, you know, as I was heading into college. And now, not that they've fallen far, but they're not as, they're not seen as value, even though they're, they were limited production. They're not as valuable as they once were. Um, I mean, some of these cars were gone for a quarter million, half a million, three quarters of a million dollars. And you're right. Yeah, you're right. And I've been watching Barrett Jackson since 2004. Yeah, that's when I graduated college was 04, actually. I mean, high school. Sorry, yeah. high school. Um, so I'm yeah. a, you know, I'm a young pup. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, <It's true>. uh, <laughs> but that's, that's the, I feel like some of those cars now are going to drop, uh, especially because I think bring a trailer, nothing against them, but I think they're a big issue. They're the modern day Barrett Jackson, where you could put any car on there and, it's worth 20 grand more on there than it is anywhere else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that we could see a, a surge in a lot of those classic cars being, you know, just coming up for sale and people just not spending the kind of money that they were. But the biggest problem is going to be the banks. The banks are, whether it be new cars or used cars, they're going to want to dictate the value and who gets what. And that's what worries me. What do you think is going to happen with that? So when I was selling cars, uh, before uh, there was Wells Fargo, there was Wachovia. And oh yeah, I remember Wachovia. <laughs> so I, I used to be a joke. Um, I don't know if I don't know how far this joke re, you know went across the country, but it instead of Wachovia, people would call it Walk All Over You. Yes, okay. yes, because I was in college in Cincinnati, <laughs> and Wachovia was big there. Obviously, yeah, and yes, I remember that. You, I okay. So they were they were terrible. They were an awful bank. I had my money in there, and they were the worst. But also, when I was selling cars. 
one of my managers was friends with the manager of a local Wachovia branch. And so what he would do is if we had somebody, and this, this is absolutely awful. I mean, this was something I, I kept telling the guys that I sold cars with. They would always tell me to shut up and go away. But I would always say, guys, you know, do you not see the writing on the wall here? Like what we're doing? There's something bad going to happen from all this. Like the market is being flooded. And so what was happening was we would have somebody who could not absolutely not afford a car. Didn't have the credit, didn't have the resources, didn't have the finances, nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my managers would call his friend at Wachovia and be like, hey, buy this buy this person. I, I need to sell him a car. We'll repo it in the next month or two. It'll be fine. <laughs> Oh my and, gosh. <laughs> right? And that's what that's what would happen. And so <sighs> exactly. The same noise as I made. I was like, I'm not I'm not playing this game. I don't like this at all. There's something very fishy. And I saw some of those cars genuinely come back and it was horrible. It's horrifying. So we'd sell Yeah, that's pretty terrible. Yeah, we'd sell a person a new Mazda or a new Kia or a used car. And then a month or two later we'd get it back with thousand fifteen hundred miles on it and then we'd sell it for damn near what it was brand new you know and wow. it was terrible absolutely awful um <clears throat> and that's what that's what i fear now granted since the credit crisis we have changed things we have written rules and laws to kind of prevent some of that happening I don't know the exact information because I don't have any sources that are willing to necessarily, you know, go on the record or even give me too much outside of it's starting to happen a little bit more and more. They're starting to mm -hmm. figure out how to do it behind the scenes. They're starting to figure out, you know, a, a way around some of these rules and regulations. And that's what worries me. The banks always want theirs and they're going to try and screw over anybody to get what's theirs, you know, or what they deem is, is, theirs it makes me wonder what is going to happen with the next generation in terms of how they're going to see capitalism mm -hmm. and banking structure mm -hmm. and you know are they going to feel differently than the previous generation i'm not saying anything's right or wrong right. but i'm wondering if that will shape well surely it will shape how they see business and how it's structured going forward well it has to i mean you know if you if you look at you know my father's 69 um I'm thir I'll be 34 in May and you look at the differences in how we believe capitalism should work. We're pretty drastically different. <laughs> my father, right, right. my father owned his own business for 24 years of extremely successful, uh, 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 corporate travel agency that he sold just a few years ago. He knows the, that business inside and out. Knows all of it. Mm -hmm. I worked for him for three years doing that stuff too, or helping out with the media coordination of his company. And so I saw a lot of the day to day. I saw a lot of the goods and the bads, whether it be the airline industry or industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. And he and I have differing beliefs on how capitalism should or is defined and how it should work from the definition, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you see, you look at the, the, the surgence of, of people like Bernie Sanders, you know, and you see where, and you also see where young people are, are hesitant to go out and vote because they feel like nobody's listening to them anyway. Yeah. You know, I, I'll be, again, I'll be 34 in May and I, 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 I jump to the chance to go vote, you know? Oh, for sure. I take, and I take my son with me to vote yeah. you know, and I kind of explain to him why I'm voting for these people and. We talk about women in politics. And right. We talk about politics in general, and it's. I mean, I, every parent's biased on their own, of course, their own beliefs. But you try to give your kids some some foundation. Yeah, some foundation and some room to make their own theories as well. Right. I mean, I you know one of one of the most interesting bonding experiences I ever I ever had with my dad was he actually took me to vote in 2004 for the presidential election when I turned 18. That was the first time I, I voted, and I was happy to vote, and I was excited. I was excited mm -hmm. and, and he taught me, he told me then, I mean, from a young age, he always told me we vote because we care. We vote for who we want, but we vote because we care for our country. You know, people are going to have different beliefs of everything, but we vote because we think we matter. We think we can make a difference. And I, I hold that true today, you know? Yeah. Um, but now moving on, because I feel like we've kind of exhausted that topic a little bit. 
um, now you and I met on a, a press launch for the Toyota Corolla. And right. Yeah, right. Um, and obviously we both reviewed that car. I don't know if you got any seat time in the manual. Uh, or if I I've... did not. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. So luckily, because uh, Corey Prophet of Toyota, whom I love, uh, and love adore, him. I, yes, he's amazing. Him and Rod, I love both of them dearly. Um, he and Rod actually. So before Rod ran Drive Shop on the East Coast, Corey did uh, for my section, and Corey actually sent me my first ever press car. <laughs> That's so it was, cool. Yeah, so it was a Mazda Speed Three that I got. Uh, that, that he sent me first ever press card. Now I'd gotten press cards before that, but I went to actually, I went to places to go over BMW loaned me a couple of cars, but I actually went to New Jersey to pick them up and drive them to North Carolina and then review them and drive them back to New Jersey. Yeah. Um, but that was the first uh, Mazda speed three was the first car that ever got dropped off in my driveway. And, uh, but because of Corey and he knows I'm obsessed with manual gearboxes. Every time there's a Toyota with a manual gearbox, he basically sends it my way as soon as he can. Uh, so I've reviewed, I've reviewed four different Corollas. I, I went on the press launch for the Corolla. I reviewed the pre-production, uh, a pre-production version of the Corolla hatchback. Uh, sadly, it had a it had a CVT. It didn't have a manual. But then I got, um, uh, I also had a a, a manual um, hatchback as well that he sent me about a year later. So it's kind of funny. He basically sends me everything I can get manual wise. What do you think of the state of the manual gearbox? Does it bother you that car companies are moving away from it? And like when you see cars like the Toyota Supra or the or the new Corvette, the C8 Corvette, does it bother you or does it just you're just kind of like, "Nah, whatever." Well, you know, I'm kind of I have mixed feelings. And I'll give you some context. The first car that I was supposed to have was a a 1980 to maybe an 81 Chevrolet Citation. Oh man, my it parents was had one of those. little car, it, yeah, and it was a manual. And my dad tried to teach me. Mm-hmm. And he, my dad, has an artificial arm. He lost his right arm in a car crash when he was 16. Oh wow. So he is amazing. He can shift and, and um, you know, he can use the clutch with his feet, of course. And then he reaches over with his left hand and shifts the car. That's your, how he always your did. Your dad's it. my new hero. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's he's an awesome dad. That's awesome. So he tried to teach me, and I panicked, and I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. So they gave up and sold it, and they bought me a 1977 Dodge Aspen that was automatic. It was like a, a couch on wheels. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so by the time I actually drove my first manual, it was on a racetrack. It was a, one of the Richard Petty racetracks. Wow, really? So one of the NASCAR yeah. experiences? or Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that was the first time I drove a manual, and since then, you know, I've, I've, I know how to drive a manual, but I'm not an expert at it. So I didn't develop that love for it that some people have that mm-hmm. have driven it full time. So I'm kind of torn. Like I, I see the beauty of it. I, I love the purest factor of it, but I also know that in terms of technology, they're making the automatics so good now mm-hmm. that it's, it's one less thing you have to do and. You know, I kind of, I kind of like my driving experience to be, to be seamless, and it's less distractions on the road too. So for younger drivers, that has a has an appeal too. So I think there's a little of both. So that that's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting take on it. Because so when I was talking to Alana Shear yesterday, uh, she was saying that she doesn't mind it because you can still buy old cars with manuals. And yeah, for sure, there's still an industry where new cars some people are taking new cars and turning them to manuals you know or newer cars i should say um so that's that's an interesting take uh as well for you because you obviously you see it from kind of a different angle where your first car was supposed to be a manual uh but then it ended up being an automatic whereas for me my first car was supposed to be a manual but then accidentally became an automatic as well so i you know i i'm I'm with you on that one and then, but then when I bought my first manual car, which was a 2006 Mazda, Mazda Speed 6, that's what actually made me want to go sell Mazdas. And then from there, I haven't owned a, an automatic car since. Oh, nice. Yeah. But that's because I'm, I'm a nut job. I, I'm insane. Well. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> manual car? I'll take it. Um, and so going along with that, what is your daily driver? What do you drive every day? 
Um, we have two cars in our garage. One is a 2000 Range Rover in the P8, P38 body style. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's got 170,000 miles on it. Wow. And we also have a 2013 Land Rover LR4. My husband is a Land Rover nut. That's all he cares about. <laughs> that's funny. <fine. laughs> so, that's awesome. I think those are great vehicles. Yeah, no, I drive press cars a lot of the time. Right. And when it comes to manuals, I had a Fiat 500 manual recently mm. that I drove around, and that was pretty fun. And I think one of the best manuals on the market on the mainstream is the Honda Civic Type R. You know, I have not driven that car yet. I haven't. Oh, man. It's killing and, me. You know, from someone who's not a, a big manual driver, but I know how. Mm-hmm. That one I thought was so easy and smooth to drive. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, they always say that if you're going to teach somebody to drive a manual, always teach them on a Honda because it's one of the best ways to drive a manual car in general. Yeah, Um, I have to agree. My brother had a manual Honda Accord, a 2006, 2007. And I drove that a few times and I was like, you know, this really is good. Like it's just, you know, it just... It just is, you know, it just works, mm-hmm. does its thing. It's not, you know, it's not terrible to drive. Um, and, and going along with that kind of piggybacking on that, when you're talking about, you know, obviously reviewing cars, what is, what's a car that you, that got away from you, either a car that you, uh, almost got to review and you didn't, or a car you almost got to buy. Hmm. I almost got to review. So the very first car that I ever reviewed was supposed to be a Lamborghini. <laughs> the very first car. The very first car you were supposed to review was supposed to be yep. a Lamborghini. Yep. When I started you know, writing about cars, <laughs> I've, I've loved cars my whole life. But like the first time I was going to have an actual article about a car, it was supposed to be about a Lamborghini. I convinced an exotic sports car rental company to let me drive one in exchange for some coverage. That's hilarious. So I got there, and as it turned out, the Lamborghini was out. But the Ferrari F430 was in. <laughs> That's funny. So so the, F, the Ferrari F430 was the first one. <laughs> That's funny. That's amazing. So that's interesting. You went from Lamborghini. <laughs> so now which do you prefer, Ferrari or Lamborghini? That's tough because uh, probably two years after that, I went and drove the Lam- the 2018 Lamborghini Aventador S, mm-hmm. and I fell in love with that car, and to this day, it's it's one of my favorites. It's a fantastic car. I've never driven it, but it is a fantastic oh, car, obviously. It is so... Well, I got to drive it on a track. Oof. It was more of a road rally kind of track, so mm-hmm. it didn't have long straightaways. Right. I could only get up to about 100. But it was Still, it gets up to 100 fun. very quickly. <laughs> it sure does. It is so fun. And it was an automatic, you know, so right. they're building them better and better. They are. They really are. It's it's a shame. I hate it because obviously I, I still prefer manuals. Like I would pay extra for a manual in, in any car. But the automatics are getting a lot better. I mean, some of them are extremely good and characteristic, you know, have character. Uh, some of them are not good and don't have any character whatsoever. But, right, right. So, you know, you, I know that you love 50s cars. Yes. And <laughs> that just, yes, that, so yes. now you're in the 50s cars, you you love them. Is it the car, is it the styling or do you get in, like, do you do the pinup style stuff or is that something you're interested in as well? Is like, what, what grabs you about 50s, about the 1950s in general? I love the the exterior design of the 50s cars. And my mom and dad brought my sister and I up going to car shows. And, of course, they were born in the 40s. So the 50s would have been the cars that they saw when they were teenagers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? And so those were the cars that they loved. My mom had a Rambler. But she has a particular affinity for the the 59 Chevrolets that have the triple tail lamps. Yeah. Right. And my dad loves Corvettes. He had, I think, two Corvettes before I was born. He had a 66, but he always loved the 63, and I think he always wanted to have a 63. So uh, the split window, and it turns out my neighbor across the street from me has a mint 63 black Corvette. 
And so I always hear it when he takes it out for a drive. And one day I happened to be outside when he was bringing it back in and I stopped and talked to him about it for a little while. It's interesting. That's thrilling. That's actually how I got into cars or, you know, what uh, I was like cars from a young age, but when I was 10 was when my dad first made it successful in business and he bought a fully restored 1967 uh, Corvette 427 400 coupe with factory side pipes, factory AM FM, factory heating and air conditioning, Elkhart blue with light blue interior, factory four speed manual. And I, I fell head over heels in love. And so that's, <laughs> that's the, I've always wanted a 60s Corvette. But interestingly enough, the 1963 is the only 60s Corvette I don't want. Interesting. I am like the least amount of fanboy you can be about the split window. I don't know why. I just don't. It doesn't appeal to me. My dad loves it. Everybody I know loves it. And me, I'm like, that's eh, cool. I'd rather have a 64 Fuelie. And all right, fair enough. But my dad thinks I'm crazy because he's like, the fuel injection cars sucked. I'm like, no, the fuel injection cars were great. No one, everyone thought they had to be tuned like a carbureted car. And so they destroyed the fuel injection. That's why they, that's why they screwed it up. The Fuelies are awesome. But yeah, no, it's, my dad and I have this <laughs> constant argument because he's like, I drove the Fuelies. They sucked. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I haven't been able to drive a Fuelie because everybody ruined them. So now I can't drive one, you know? <laughs> so, right. So 60s well, cars are, are a rather big passion of mine. So it's kind of funny that you, that your, your parents were fifties. My dad was sixties. You know, those were his teenage years. Yep. Um, so what is your, beautiful? what's your favorite fifties car? So my parents bought me, I don't have it right in front of me, but I was looking at it yesterday. I had a book. It was created in 1985. It's called Fabulous Cars of the 50s. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it has a pink and white 1955 Ford Fairlane Crown Victoria with a oh, bubble top. Oh, man. Yeah. And so that became my dream car probably when I was a teenager. Um, and the, the, this, the bubble top was not very practical. It didn't no. have any kind of shade. It let the, it let the sunlight in to beat down on you like <laughs> crazy and you couldn't yeah. get away from it. Right. Yeah. They made less than a thousand of them. I don't think that many survive today, but if I could have a 1955 Ford Fairlane Crown Victoria with it as a resto mod. Oh, that right. Would be okay. A dream. So that's, you, you bring up the perfect topic, which was my next segue. What do you think of resto mods? Love, love, love. I love it because then you can have the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. To me, the design of the 50s is superior to the design of today, unless you're looking at some of the, the luxury brands like you know, Aston Martin makes gorgeous cars. Of course. Yeah, their design is still intact. It's beautiful. But I would want to have the power steering and power braking and all the safety features that they have now. Right. So that would be my dream. Well, and that's that's the thing. I talked to my buddy recently about this. My my uh, one of my best friends, Rob. He has he just sold his 1950 Cadillac. Uh, he had a Series 62 um, hmm. that he actually that was he drove it for his wedding, and like we uh, he's had it for years, but he finally sold it. Um, and uh, cause he just he wasn't able to do any more on it because he was doing. He actually. Um, is a mechanic and helps to restore classic cars and resto mod classic cars as well. So he finally sold it because he has his absolute dream car, which is a 56 uh, Coupe de Ville, a pillarless yeah. Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Um, That's cool. And it's amazing. He bought it from a guy. I think he spent like four grand on it. Uh, it's basically, you know, it was just basically a, a non running shell. It had an engine and everything, but it, it needed some work and he's been working on it ever since, you know, as much as he can little by little. And, but we were talking about that cause he always, he always talks about how nothing looks like a fifties car. Nothing today looks as good as they, you know, as it was in the fifties. And we always Agreed. have, this, yeah. And, and it is true. It is true. <laughs> nothing fifties, sixties, even forties. And some of the twenties cars were amazing to look at. I mean, I still look at, you know, the old, the, the original, uh, W O Bentley cars, you know, the, the original designs of those. I'm going, Oh my God, they're so gorgeous, you know? And, um, <laughs> they are. <laughs> and, but we always have this argument cause he's always like, they could make any fifties car now with style. They could do it today. And I'm like, not with the crash standards. They can't, they can't do any of that stuff anymore. You know, they would, they would from, from the, especially pedestrian, uh, uh, crash test standards, fifties cars would just, would just 
run over anything and just mangle everybody in the way. So it is a shame because when you look back at those cars and the inspiration after World War II from the ships and the planes and you look at, you know, especially the portholes on the side, you know, with Buick and everything. It's right. There's so many beautiful features. And what was it like 53 or 55 was the first uh, uh, automatic hardtop convertible, right? Mm, I don't remember which year it was. I think but it, that's probably right. Yeah, and then and then it it it's amazing to me that um, Rob's uh, Cadillac, his '56 Coupe de Ville, has automatic windows, which I think is hilarious for a '50s era car. <laughs> and then it has um, it has oh god, I'm trying to remember what what it is, but it's some technology. It's I think it actually has. I want to say it's. Uh, auto high beams. Really? I, th- I don't I'm, know they offered that. Thing. I'm trying to remember what it what it is, but there's this weird thing in the center of the of um just above the gauge cluster uh on the uh front of the windshield and it like monitors I think headlights or something if I recall correctly. I'm trying to remember. Of course, now I'm blanking on it. Um but yeah, it's it's it is wonderful. We actually did. I had my parents uh, few, for a number of years. They they loved the Cadillac Escalade, um, and they had uh, an ESV at one point in time a few years ago. And I had to drive it. Uh, he lives about three hours away from me, and I had to drive to his town because they have a an IKEA, and I don't have an IKEA near me. So I had to go out there, and I drove the the Escalade ESV out there. We were hanging out. We measured his Coupe de Ville with the Escalade ESV. And they're the exact same length. <laughs> wow. They were the same length. I was like, this is ridiculous. That it's that is that, crazy. It is, it is absolutely absurd, but it's awesome. <laughs> you know, it's, it's awesome. Um, and yeah, they're beautiful cars back then. But what do you think going from the 50s to the 60s? Do you, you know, my buddy Rob is like, you know, 60s is just so modern. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on there, champ. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he always says, like, I don't know if I could have a 60s car. They're great, but they're just a little too modern sometimes. Oh, modern. my gosh. That's, <laughs> if that's modern, holy hell. But Well, they did get streamlined quite a bit. You they know, they're, did. They're more boxy mm-hmm. than the 50s cars were. And, and the 40s were super rounded and mm-hmm. sensual curves. And then the 50s became more, you know, pointy and... I don't know I'm trying to think how else to describe them but they were like sharks right you know they're all finned and finned and toothy well i feel like 60s they finally got a handle on post-war production you know um just pumping cars out right you know i was saying to my wife that you know the mustang they made their first million cars within you know within the 60s and it took them you know it took the miata what 20 years to have a million cars or 10 million cars whatever it was Right. And I was like, you know, the, you look at the 60s, they made a billion of everything. They finally figured out how to just pump them out with, you know, 14 different engine uh, configurations, 78 different, you know, uh, interior styles, you know, and every year they changed like the way the taillights were or the headlights were or something is something, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and now, God, you sometimes we wait five, seven years for a new car, you know. And uh, or even for tweaks. Yeah, that's true. Uh, if you look at, you know, if you think about the 60s, that's when the VWs and the VW buses were really popular. Right. And the roundedness and hippie kind of thing that that had going on. Which is. But then that's when Ford came out with the GT as well. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it, it is. It is interesting. The 60s are. I mean, that's my favorite time for music. Uh, I had a girlfriend years ago when I was in high school and she asked me. She said, if you could have been born, she said, I feel like if you, if you could have been born, you would have been born in, in the fifties. So that way you would have been a teenager in the sixties when all the cool stuff was happening. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I, I love that stuff. I love, I love, I'm a big blues music guy. So the fifties and sixties were big times for blues music. Um, but I told her, I said, no, I, I wouldn't want to because I'd have to wait for it all to come out. Like, I love it. I love it now. You know, uh, my favorite band of all time, sorry, my dog is going crazy, but my favorite band of all time is Cream. And, you know, they were only around for two years in the late 60s. And, but yet the 60s to me are what the 50s are to you and Rob, the 60s are to me. Huh. 
So yeah. Well, that's that's pretty interesting, and it'll be interesting to see how that shapes you as you get older, like the next twenty years or so. So yeah. And my dad is seventy six, and he has a Chevy HHR that he loves. <laughs> really. He loves that thing. I think it's 10 years old now. But I think that the HHR and also the PT Cruiser kind of evoked that style. That retro. You know, that throwback style yeah. that people loved. And, you know, certain demographics really loved that car. Actually, I've seen PT Cruisers on the road out here in West Texas. I don't see them ever in Austin. I sold, um, I sold way too many of them to, <laughs> to people as used cars. And I hated every moment that I sold them because I knew that I'd have to go on a test drive in them. <laughs> and I absolutely hated them. It was so funny because when I was 13, when they when I first saw it, when I was 13, I was like, this is so cool. And then I became a car salesman and had to drive. And I was like, this is so awful. And uh, uh, But, you know, there there is a demographic that loves those cars. I, I it, yep. It's hilarious. And people, especially when they put a turbo in them, they were like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, calm down there, champ. But you know, so people just people just love that style. But like the BMW Z8 from the early 2000s, it was designed to look like the uh, BMW 507 from the 50s. You know, and that's right. Then you had the Ford Thunderbird or the, the T-Bird that was a you know obviously was supposed to be like the you know the 55s, uh, and sadly it did not do anything like the 55. Um, oh, I wanted one so badly, though. I really wanted one. I did, too. I didn't get one. I thought they were great when they were new, and now I'm going, oh, thank God I didn't do it. Thank God. <laughs> and I knew so many people with them. I don't know if you know a guy named Josh Hancock. Um, I know the name. So Josh, uh, a very, very fun guy, very interesting guy, um, does a lot with uh, movies and television, like placing cars and making cars for movies and television and stuff. Very cool. um, he actually made the cars for uh, um, um, uh, the cat in the hat uh, for the movie. And it's mm-hmm. funny because the first one of the first times I met him, he used to be on car and driver radio uh, with a guy named Charlie Vogelheim. And I love those two guys. I love their dynamic. First time I, I met Charlie, I told him I was a big fan. He said, he's looking around of whose? I was like, of yours. He goes, Why? I was like, ah. so anyway, so he introduced me to Josh Hancock and John, Josh pulled out a wad of money and started to give me $10 as a joke. And he goes, no, 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 you don't have to pay him. He's a real fan. He actually likes us. And so, you know, I became friendly with both of them ever since. But Josh actually has the uh, yellow Ford Thunderbird that Alec Baldwin drove in the movie. He kept that one for himself. So that oh, is, wow. so he actually has that car. Um, so he has an affinity for those cars. He, he loves them. Um, in fact, when I told him that, uh, that I love the movie cat in the hat, I think it's, I think it's a good movie. I thought it was entertaining and funny. Mm-hmm. Everybody else I know hated it. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought it was very <laughs> funny and entertaining. And I think he actually told me I was the first person that ever complimented him on the movie. Um, Oh, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But um but yeah, he has that car. He loves it. And uh and I I wish they'd make another Ford Thunderbird because I th- I think it could be cooler uh now. But uh, you know, now with the state of automobiles as they are, eh, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen there. But Yeah, we'll see what happens. I do think that there's a lot there's been a lot of talk about how millennials don't like cars and blah blah blah. And I just don't think that's true. I don't believe what I've that. seen. If you go to Radwood, which is awesome fun, by the way, oh, with all the 80s and 90s cars. Yeah, I've heard it's are amazing. Into it. I was going to yeah. say, and they're 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds yeah, totally. that, are, that are obsessed with 80s culture, you know, 80s and 90s culture. Yeah, I, 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 think it's, I think it's awesome. I agree with you. I don't think – I think it's, it's overblown and it's overhyped um, that millennials don't like cars. I think there are a lot of, of millennials in general. And I think the biggest thing is millennials, I, I'm a part of this this millennial crowd, so I, I speak with a little bit of experience, um, but I feel like millennials don't want to give you an answer regardless. So even if even if you said to them, do you like cars? They'd be like, no, nah, they're fine, you know, whether they like them or not. So I feel like millennials are just kind of guarded in most of their answers. So I don't know that the data really can support any answer, yes or no. Um, but every millennial that I come across, Loves them. I mean, I drive, yeah. I, my daily driver is, 20, is a 2017 GT350. And 
Every time I drive the car, children that are not millennials and millennials alike are flabbergasted at seeing it and hearing it. That's really cool. I so, mean, a car is freedom. You've got to have right. your freedom. And exactly. In your teen years and your, your younger, well, throughout your life. I mean, your car is how you get to where you want to go. It's your freedom of expression. It's your it's your freedom of, of moving around. I mean, God, when I got my license, oh, it. do you remember that time when you got your license? Oh, yeah. And you were able to, it was like life <laughs> changed forever. You could go anywhere, do anything. Um, now I got my license in the era of cell phones. So my parents were still calling me yelling at me to get home. Um, <laughs> but like, that didn't happen to me <laughs> <laughs> when I first got my license. Yeah. They're calling a pay phone. You know, they're screaming. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when I first got my license, my curfew, I think was seven o'clock. I was like, what the hell? Come on freedom. And my mom's like, not yet. <laughs> not till you move out and start paying for your own crap. Um, and also this is, uh, this is a segue to our next topic, family cars. I feel like the fifties, that was the beginning of the family car, you know, the, Mm -hmm. the family truckster of sorts, you know, the, the big long, uh, um, uh, station wagons like your mom likes and like you like, and then, you know, big trucks and, and SUVs. And now. We, I mean, a family car is on every corner. You go out. If I walk out into my driveway, every car in everybody's garage and driveway is a family car. And some of them don't even have families. Mm-hmm. So what do you think of, of the massive overtaking of family cars? And what are some of your favorite family cars? Oh, wow. So many choices. There are a ton. Because like every car is a family car. I, I consider my GT350 a family car because it has 13 and a half cubic feet of trunk space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one of the outlets I write for is CarMax. Mm-hmm. And when I'm writing about a vehicle, I'm thinking about, you know, who would buy this car? And sometimes, you know, like I talked to the the global lead propulsion engineer for the Chrysler Pacifica minivan is a A woman and she's a single woman. Yeah. Awesome minivan. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I pick up my girlfriends and we go out in that thing. It's great. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's not just a family car. So I think there's a lot of blurred lines between what's family car and what's just a car that's great for hanging out or, you know, just picking people up and having some fun or going out to dinner. Right. You know, the communal feel. Right. I think maybe marks this next generation. Um, some of my favorites, I love the Durango SRT because it's got the muscle car power mm-hmm. with the room of an SUV. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm driving a Chevrolet Traverse High Country right now. That's That was really comfortable. I drove it across Texas yesterday. They make a High Country and a Traverse? I didn't know that. They do. That's funny. Yeah, it's really nice. That's interesting. I I didn't expect that in a traverse. Yeah, it's really it's really nice. We we enjoyed it. My son and I drove from Austin to San Angelo. It's like three and a half hours. It's mm. not too bad. But right now it's wildflower season. Oh right, and yeah. It's such a beautiful drive. What would so, you say um, of the traverse versus a suburban? I mean, obviously they're similar sizes in terms of you know the seat capacity. But obviously, they're very different in terms of who's going to buy them. Um, mm-hmm. But what what would you prefer as a family car? A Suburban with that extra length and the extra size as a whole? Or that Traverse, something that's a little bit more streamlined and, and a little bit better fuel mileage overall? For me, I'd pick the Traverse because it's easier to park. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it just feels a little bit more, well, it feels a lot more nimble to me mm-hmm. to just get it, get it around and you can park, you can still park it in the city. Mm-hmm. More car-like. Yeah, it's more car-like. And I don't often need three rows, but I like that it has three rows. And in the case of this Traverse, it has the uh, the electronic third row. So right. you don't have to work with any straps or <laughs> oh, <I love laughs> it's that. very easy to put it up and down. So I put the third row down yesterday, put my son's bike and all of our luggage and a whole box of food in there. So there's plenty of room. Now, what would you say? I, I was always a big fan of the Ford Flex. And obviously, they just recently stopped making that. What Did you like the Ford Flex? I, oh, I that's dislike the hesitation. <laughs> I didn't dislike it. I didn't love the shape of it. I, oh, see, love, I love the boxy shape. shape. <laughs> but... 
I think the same people that love the Soul would love the Ford Flex because it does make good use of all the available space that it has. And I like the Soul. I like the Kia yeah. Soul. I, I've always the said that, a nice little car. the things that the Soul is missing, uh, I want it to have all-wheel drive, a turbo, and a manual gearbox, and I want that as you know the new age, 80s, you know, uh, boxy manual all-wheel drive like off-road car. Like I, I want, I want the Kia Soul as as a real rally car from the eighties. That's what I want. I just hmm. is that too much to ask? I mean, no, no. Well, I the mean, manu- you can get the Soul Turbo now. Well, the, but... I mean, Kia seemed to think so. They've told me no. So <laughs> ah. <laughs> I said I want all wheel drive, a turbo, and a manual. They're like, look, we'll give you the turbo, but that's about it. And I'm like, but I want the <laughs> that's rest. All of you stuff. get? Yeah, that's all you get. Look, be happy you get that's one of the three. Get. Shut up. Um, I do have a good friend with the Ford Flex, and she calls it the sexy flexy. <laughs> <laughs> my brother used to have a Flex, and his in-laws and my parents and my whole family, everybody gave him hell for the whole like three or four years that he had it. Jason and I loved it. My brother, he used to sell Fords as well. Uh, we sold cars at the same time. We just sold at different dealerships. He sold Ford. I sold Mazda Kia. And we both loved the Flex. We both thought it was amazing. the The biggest thing that the Flex needed was bigger, beefier wheels. Um, and uh, outside of that, you know, maybe a little bit more cooler styling in the front. But I love the boxy shape. It was cool. I think the Kia Soul would also benefit from bigger wheels. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. They feel tiny. Yes, they feel very tiny holding up this car, and I think I think it would look better and drive better, ride better with I, bigger wheels. I think 19s really would would be fine. The 1920s would be fine for it uh, because the, you know a 20 inch wheel 15 years ago was drastically massive, but a 20 inch wheel now or 19 inch wheel now is really kind of the norm. You know, yeah. and and now with modern suspension the way that they are, and and you know the technology, the adaptive suspension is so good. I mean, there are there are Porsches with twenty one, twenty two inch wheels that drive just as well, if not better, than the ones with smaller wheels. Well, that sounds lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your dream family car? If you could think of any car ever made that you could just cruise, do one of those nineteen fifties or sixties era cruises around the country, or you know, from you know New York to uh, to Florida or something like that, what would be the ultimate car for that? Of all time. Mm-hmm. Oh boy! I know. I don't, a, even, I don't I, even know how to narrow that down. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, one of the forties, a forties Lincoln, I think would be Ooh, spectacular yeah. or a fifties era Rolls Royce, you Ooh. know, with the, with the trays in the back. Yeah, the trays in the back. Yeah. Now that would be a wonderful cross country cruising vehicle. I feel like the going along those lines, I feel like the, the forties Cadillac limousines would be really cool. Um, yeah, it would if you had a driver. Especially. Yeah, right. I think those are pretty neat. Um, and Wi-Fi, you can have Wi-Fi in the oh car. Oh my god, I would love that. And a little refrigerator, and you would, yeah, you'd be good. Now You're I good just to go. now I just want to go on a cross-country cruise. I know. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker actually bought a God, I can't remember what year, but she bought a Country Squire um, to drive around between their their place in Manhattan with her uh, and her kids. Because mm-hmm. she said that's the car she grew up with, and she wanted her kids to be in a car like going on summer drives the way she did when she was a kid. And she <laughs> talked about that on Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee with Seinfeld. And I was like, you know, this is pretty brilliant. I like that. Like, I, th- I think it's great. She wanted to expose her kids to what she had to go through and what she loved about it, you know? So, God, I think of what we had when I was a kid. We had, a, we had one of those station wagons uh, that had the seats that faced back. Yeah, those were awesome. I remember that, and we had, we had an old minivan, like an old Voyager or something, or a caravan. We had a caravan. Oh yeah, my mom hated station wagons, so I was always very angry with her. I'll never forgive her because all my friends' uh, moms had the Volvo seven forties and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> with the rear facing seats and I always wanted that. I was like, This is so cool. Mom, can we get one? Can we get one? She was like, Absolutely not. That is ugly. <laughs> I'm like, No, it's so awesome. Mom. <laughs> mom John you're... down the street has one. Yeah. Mom, fair. you hate me. I know you hate me. <laughs> you don't you're the love worst me. mom ever. Worst mom ever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When mom and I when my mom and I argue now, we I still bring that up. 
You didn't want a station wagon when I was dead. How dare you? <laughs> so talking about awesome. talking about uh, old cars to new and you know resto modding and new cars as a whole. What are some modern car features that you hate that you love, and what are some that you love to hate? I love to hate the auto on off. It drives me nuts. <laughs> I can't stand they're it. They're the worst. And some of them are worse than others. Some <sighs> of them are fairly smooth, but some of them like. You feel like you just got jolted right? when it starts up again. That drives me crazy. I'm not going to name any names right here right now. <laughs> some of them are just not great. Um, things I love adapted, adaptive cruise control. And I used that a lot yesterday when I drive across Texas because there's a lot of, there's a lot of one lane highways mm-hmm. and it just lets you kind of go. You just turn it on and you're, you're going to stay, you, you know, you're not going to get a speeding ticket because you're right. going to stay at the speed limit or better. Right. That's another feature that I really love too on, uh, when a car has navigation that shows you the speed limit, mm-hmm. it displays the speed limit for you. I love that in the head up displays as well. Yeah. Yeah. I love that too. A lot of the cars now are coming out with, uh, they show stop signs and stuff like that, which I think are really good. Um, mm-hmm. but what is, you know, as, as a woman who loves cars, who reviews cars, mm-hmm. you know, what would, what kind of advice would you give men talking to women about cars? Don't assume that we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> and that's obvious, right? Right. That should be obvious. I, I was, let's see. The very first event I went to um, with Texas Auto Riders, we had an Alfa Romeo four, or three C. We had a three C, and I'd never driven one before, and I'd never seen those controls before, mm-hmm. and I could not figure out how to get it into gear. And so, you know, I took a minute. I'm like, okay, what? You know, this is this is something new. And so I called one of the other near journalists that were nearby, and I said, hey, could you? you know, do you know how to make this work? And, and he's like, Oh, you know, he's an older <laughs> guy. Oh, little lady, you can't, right. you can't get it going. Well, guess what? <laughs> he could not either. So <laughs> I felt vindicated. And then I'm the one that figured it out in, in the long run, but you were like, really. shoe meet other foot. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't assume there's still some, you know, there's still some people who believe that, you know, women are for pinup pictures and, you know, just to look pretty in cars. And, right. And that's just antiquated. I mean, it's like, come on, we're, we're way past that or we should be. It's funny you say that because I, all of my life have always hated car modeling. I either want mm-hmm. to see the car or the woman. What I don't, I don't, I don't care about like a woman sprawled across the car in a bathing suit or a woman washing my car in a bathing suit. I don't care. Just, I just want to drive the car, you know, I want to enjoy the car. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care about this, you know, misogynistic, sexist, weirdo, you know, fantasy yeah. where I have to, you know, let me sit in a director's chair and watch a woman wash my car. Why? Why? Does she know how to wash the car really well? Or is she going to, you know, <laughs> is she going to give me some tips on right. how to wash the car properly? <laughs> exactly. Otherwise it's like, it becomes like, yeah, misogynistic, Cornish kind right. of voyeurism and yeah i don't i don't take that either well and also how many how many people do you know that really know how to actually wash a car properly i mean at that point you might as well just give a four-year-old a hose and a bucket and see what they do (laughs) you know it's like my 10 year old could do a pretty good job yeah and so it's like it's like okay so i'm just great i'm just gonna have somebody ruin my paint it's awesome so excited actually my my 10 year old and i last summer when my husband was out of town we hand detailed his Range Rover, his 2000 Range Rover. That's like awesome. inch by inch because it was, he doesn't believe in going to car washes too often. So he's like, eh, it's fine. It's character. I will say yeah. neither he do I, it. I have my GT350. <laughs> I don't think I've washed it in six months. Um, I am terrible about it. Everybody hates on me for it, but you know what? I always say I like the way a dirty car looks better than I like the way a clean car looks. Um, well, I'm well power to you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you're like, eh. I don't get it, but okay. <laughs> so you're the president of the Texas Auto Writers Association, correct? That's right. So yes. what is what does that do? What is what what exactly what is your you know obviously your role as president, but what do you handle? What do you make sure of? It's a lot of work for no money. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 
I feel like that's oh, most I, of journalism, actually. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's partially true, too. What I love about Texas Outer Writers, so this is my third year on the board. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And my first year as president. And what oh. I'm finding is that there's a, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for mm-hmm. community. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of opportunity to help people learn and collaborate. And we also have two events that we run. One is the Auto Roundup, which was supposed to take place in April at the Texas Motor Speedway. Mm -hmm. But we postponed that. And then we have our big Texas Truck Rodeo, which is in its 28th year or something like that. Oh, wow. And we go off-roading and on-roading and we test as many trucks as we can, and that is a lot of fun, too, because it gives you a chance to drive the trucks side by side yeah. and compare. And then we do some voting, and people get to choose the truck of Texas and the SUV of Texas and that kind of thing. That's awesome. That's very Yeah, cool. it's yeah. really great. We also have a scholarship element where we give money to a local um, press organization for college students. Oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. And we have an excellence in craft competition, which you know anybody can enter. <laughs> and you can enter and I think it's maybe $15 per entry or something like that. And that helps us pay the judges, but we have third party judges oh, cool. that are veterans in the industry That's and cool. you get really cool trophies. So last year I won best in magazine and newspaper. Oh, congratulations. That's fantastic. It was very exciting. I'm sure it was, especially with, you know, people that you, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but for me, at least being in this industry, it's, uh, I love it for the, the people that are in it. And I, I love to be a part of the collaborations. I love to be a part of the, you know, just in the conversation with people with whatever we're talking about with cars and to be considered a peer of, of somebody who I feel is, you know, so much greater than me. I feel like that's, that's one of the coolest things. And I'm sure to have people judging you on, on, you know, on your abilities and actually believing in you and, and, you know, seeing that you're someone great. I feel like that's a very cool accomplishment. It is. It is very cool. And there are some writers that I admire a lot. Um, and some of them tend to be female writers, but I, I love Lynn um, Woodward's writing. Mm-hmm. I love Emmy Hall's writing. Yeah. I think uh, Nicole Wakelin is an awesome freelance writer. Oh, yeah. Right. And I love um, Jason. Why can't I remember Jason's last name? Harbor that writes for the Rob report. Jason. Really amazing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, you know, he has over the last couple of years really taken on, I feel like a, a Dan Neal esque, um, kind of authoritative view and opinion of the industry, you know, cause he's been, he's been doing so much the past few years. Um, been around, I feel like he's been around the world 14 times. Well, at I think this point. he has. Yeah. <laughs> but he's also, so he's also super, kind and just really wants to help the world at large. And I really like that about him. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's, I've never met him personally, but obviously I'm friends with him on Facebook and follow him on social media. And, and yeah, I agree. I feel like he has a, there's a genuine, uh, there's a genuine uh, love and appreciation uh, for what he does, you know, um, for what he talks about, what he appreciates, you know, what he enjoys. So now I know you also talk about, uh, you also, do you, you review or do you write about just aviation and technology? Well, I spent eight years with a Swiss aviation technology firm. I okay. managed marketing for North America. And after my son was born, I didn't want to travel around the world anymore. You know, I had to go to Europe quite a bit. I went to Dubai. Wow. Which was awesome until I had my son. And then I really didn't want to be that far away from him. Right. So I left. And within a week, I had an assignment with Airport Improvement Magazine. And I've been on staff with them now for uh, going on seven years. So I handle all their social media and I write a feature for every article, for every um, issue. Sorry. Oh, cool. So it could be anything from like the one I'm working on right now is a, a canvas cargo building that Southwest and FedEx are using and, and how they fit that into the airport space. I've oh, written really about, you know, technology, you know, Wi-Fi and all kinds of other technologies and software. So like, using. like my dad, like my family, you have a, a, a history in the airline world. That's right. Yeah. Airlines, airports. It's, it's a really cool industry. Great people, too. It is a very cool industry. A lot of very good people, I agree, yeah. My dad's best friend um, 
is is an executive for Delta. And those two obviously being on different sides of it, my dad being, you know, from the corporate side and, and him being from the actual airline side, they rib each other on everything and anything. It's always hilarious. They get they get in conversations <laughs> and they argue about stuff and then they catch each other at each turn. You know, so it's always very interesting to to hear them argue. But uh but I think uh, is there anything else you you want to say or you want to talk about? Is there anything else you want to mention or um I have a fairly new YouTube channel out. It was, we started it last September called Drive Mode Show mm-hmm. with Aaron Turpin, who is another freelance journalist. And he lives in Wyoming and he's hilarious. And uh, we have a lot of fun with that. So I'm really enjoying the video side. You know, my heart is in writing, but I'm also enjoying the opportunity to talk about cars. And, and it's very interactive, you know, like right. we're doing here. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I think it's, it's a it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next few years and how people are going to adapt to this latest crisis and, and figure it out. It certainly will be interesting. And I feel like, uh, I feel like YouTube is a, is a perfect angle because it's a, it's a place where people can, can be personal, you know, where you can actually be face to face in a sense with somebody. I mean, you, you know, the, the, the audience is, is coming face to face with you. Obviously you're not face to face with them, but they're seeing you Mm -hmm. and they're, there's a, um, I always, I always try and write the way I, I speak in real life in person. Um, and so it is funny when I do YouTube videos or, or when I, you know, write reviews and I, you know, I write a review on a car and I do a video of the car and people always tell me, you know, wow, you are exactly how I thought you'd be from writing, but it's the, with video, I feel like there's just, it's such a, even though it's not new, it's not fresh but it is different and unique to its own as its own medium, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I wish you luck with that because YouTube is a fun, fun Avenue. Just don't look at the comments. No, <laughs> never. No, I learned that from writing and I write about parenting as well for like the today show. Oh parenting God. Side. And people always have something nasty to say. <laughs> just, I just say in my head, I say, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, <laughs> I've gotten to the point where I absolutely love the comments. I, I love reading comments. The worse, the better in terms of with my stuff. I love it. I, it's <laughs> it's so enjoyable. I've had the worst things said to me um, and said about me. I had a guy years ago on a video I did when I first started reviewing cars. And he said, uh, spent the whole video waiting for this guy to crash and die. Um, imagine my disappointment. And uh, that was that one threw me for a loop at first. I was like, man, that's pretty rough. But the absolute worst one, the one that actually somebody sent it to my mom. I was so mad that they sent it to my mom. And, uh, it said, imagine if this guy had been aborted, we wouldn't have to watch this now. That one really upset my mom. I bet (laughs) a friend of mine, a friend of mine sent it to my mom. Like, what do you think? And I was like, don't send that stuff to my mom. Uh, but yeah, no, that was, that was, it's, it's, it's horrible to say about somebody. Why would you say that? It's ridiculous. I am not into the insulting name calling, <clears throat> being horrible online culture. I think it's totally bogus. I, I just, think it's, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's, it's, it's horrible. Yeah. It's, it's cowardly because they it is cowardly. It to your face. Right. I always say, I always say that to people, if you're not willing to, I always say the, you know, the, the thing about the locker room talk and stuff, you know, all that crap. Oh, yeah. I always say the problem I have with it is that, yes, guys are going to be guys and say stupid things around other guys. Girls are going to be girls and say, you know, different things around other girls. Absolutely. But if you are in any way afraid that somebody else that you don't want to hear it could hear it, don't say it. Don't yeah. say it. I, so, yes, I've been embarrassed by things I've said over the years, but I've openly admitted to saying them. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I'm not, yeah. I'm not yeah. hiding We've behind all it. all said dumb things. Nobody's perfect. No. But we also like, let's not create a culture of being a jerk. No, right. Exactly. Let's not celebrate it. Well, and also we should in, in, enable a culture where we see our mistakes, whether they be written or, or voiced. And we go, you know what? I'm sorry for that. That's, that was stupid. That was ridiculous. You know? Yeah. So, um, I agree. 
We're on the same page here. <laughs> Even though I'm Gen X and you're millennial, we are on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> we can all be on the same page because we all just want a better world for the, our future. You know? I like to think that, yes. That's what I hope for. I always, I always try and say that Republicans and Democrats both want a brighter future. We just want to go about it a different way. Now, of course, we can talk about the current crop of Republicans that are, in my opinion, not really holding the same ideals as former Republicans have. But, you know, it's a different conversation for a different day and a different... <laughs> That's a totally... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not go there. Yeah. It's, 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 I mean, it can relate to cars, but I'm going to have to do a special podcast about that one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and lots of hate mail will come from it. I'm sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Kristen, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me today. I'm sorry I took up so much of your time. No, I loved it. It was great. And I, I do appreciate you uh, taking the time. And uh, hopefully, um, I'm definitely going to be keeping on with the podcast. And I, I hope to... Have you back soon and and talk some more and and get some uh, exposure to your YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Thanks. You have a great podcast voice, Josh. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You have a fantastic interview voice. So (laughs) you're a great interviewee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. And I will, uh, I'll talk to you later. Sounds good. All right. Have a great time in, uh, I forget what part of Texas you're in now, but have a fantastic time off the grid and enjoy it. Absolutely. Thanks, Josh. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay. So what'd you think? I hope you enjoyed it. Again, in this time and era of COVID-19 slash coronavirus, we need to be supportive of one another. We need to allow each other to have a, a voice and listen, pay attention, but most of all, be courteous. I hope you're washing your hands. As I said in the first podcast, keep yourself healthy Keep yourself sane and protect the people you love, especially your parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. You know, I see my aunt and uncle walking through our neighborhood every few days. I wave, maybe talk to them from my front porch while they're out on the street, or maybe I, you know, stand in my driveway and talk to them, but we maintain a positive distance. Social distancing is key. We need to flatten the curve. We need to keep this going, making sure that we are always taking care of the people around us, doing what's best for everyone. Remember, during a time like this, it's about we, not me. And that's so much of what I hope to accomplish with this podcast, is that we over me. I have a website where I can express my views and say whatever the hell I want. But also, I want to bring more people into this for them to be able to say whatever the hell they want. So I hope you enjoyed Kristen's uh, podcast interview with me. And uh, I definitely can't wait to have her back on because she's phenomenal. She's awesome. Episode three will feature John Perley Huffman. And John Perley Huffman is a veteran, true veteran uh, car guy in the automotive industry of writing. (laughs) Shocker there. John actually uh, started by creating a parody magazine of car and driver and sent it out to other magazines to try and get a job. And he landed multiple, uh, job, uh, uh, offers. So again, I hope you enjoyed the Kristen Shaw interview. Uh, please go back and check out episode one. If you have not with Alana Shear and look forward to the, uh, audio podcast with John Perley Huffman coming on Friday. I'm trying to do Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for uploads, uh, for the time being to, uh, just give people some content to listen to. Hopefully you all enjoy it. Feel free to email me at josh at rawdas.com. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, critiques, criticism, whatever you want. Uh, and of course, find us on raw autos on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, all the good stuff. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next time. Well, I won't, but you'll listen to me and I will see that you've downloaded and listened to the show from my website and Podbean, which is the website that I am hosting this on. So thank you again. Happy motor. I found my
If I was-